is the master pumping station of the human body. The heart is responsible for pumping blood containing oxygen and nutrients to all of the body's tissues. The heart is the strongest muscle in the body and the heart never rests, it is always pumping. The receiving chambers of the heart are called the atria. The right atria receives deoxygenated blood from the inferior and superior vena cava. Blood then goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. After blood is in the right ventricle, it goes through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary circuit to be oxygenated by the lungs. When it comes back into the heart, it is received by the left atrium, then goes through the mitral valve, and when it's pumped out of the left ventricle, it goes out through the aortic semilunar valve into the tissues of the rest of the body. So there are two circuits, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So the systemic circuit is responsible for distributing oxygen and returning carbon dioxide to and from the rest of the body. And the pulmonary circuit brings deoxygenated blood to the lungs, oxygenates it, and then brings it back into the left atrium. The heart muscle, as you can see in the diagram, is very thick, with the left ventricle wall being the thickest. There are three layers. The epicardium is the outer layer, the inner thick muscular layer is the myocardium, and the endocardium is what lines the chambers of the heart. The heart is only one two hundredth of the body's weight. The heart requires one twentieth of the body's blood supply for its own functioning. This blood supply is supplied by the coronary arteries, and this blood is delivered when the heart muscle is relaxed. As when it is contracted, the coronary arteries are compressed. There are two main coronary arteries that then branch into two other pieces. From the anterior view, you can see the left coronary artery originating at the superior portion of the left side of the heart, and it branches into the circumflex artery, which then goes around onto the posterior side of the heart and down into the anterior interventricular artery. This is the artery that supplies the interventricular wall between the left and right ventricles. The right coronary artery branches down into the right marginal artery towards the apex of the heart. And in the back of the heart, you will see the right marginal artery and the posterior interventricular artery. And then you will see the continuation of the circumflex artery on the left and the left marginal artery. Marginal arteries can vary between people and there are many different makeups. It's important that these arteries are free of obstructions so that the heart can supply its own tissues with oxygen so that it can continue to supply the body. Atherosclerosis describes the abnormal physiology or disease process that leads to coronary artery disease. In a healthy artery, red blood cells and blood plasma can flow freely through the lumen. However, when there is an excess of fat, cholesterol, or calcium in the bloodstream, it can build up in coronary arteries and then harden, which is called atherosclerosis. The actual blockage is called the atheroma, the yellow part you see on the diagram. It can be minor or it can be significant. As they become more significant, they attract platelets and then they actually have the potential to rupture or there can be a complete blockage. Other factors that compound this are chronic stress, high blood pressure, and diabetes, which can damage or injure the walls of coronary arteries, which can result in spasms, which further narrow and limit blood flow. Coronary artery disease is classified into three types. Obstructive coronary artery disease is when more than 50% obstruction of blood flow occurs. This is more common in men. Non-obstructive coronary artery disease is when the arteries are narrowed by plaque but not obstructed, which is more common in women. Coronary microvascular disease is when small plaques in blood vessels build up within the heart. Males are at greater risk of developing coronary artery disease, as are all individuals with a body mass index of 30 or above. As well, a family history puts a person at significant risk. Diet, as we discussed earlier, which can lead to excess levels of cholesterol and low-density lipoproteins in the blood, can lead to the development of plaques. Smoking and diabetes can lead to hypertension, which can damage 
the walls of the blood vessels, which can again cause spasm and compound things. A sedentary lifestyle as well limits your body's ability to manage blood flow. The biggest danger of coronary artery disease is that it can be silent and not have any symptoms at all. Myocardial infarction or heart attack can be the first sign and a severe heart attack could lead to death. However, if there are initial signs and symptoms, people will often experience angina, which is chest pain when there are short-term disruptions to coronary blood flow that will then shortly after resolve. People will experience shortness of breath, dizziness, lightheadedness, weakness, nausea, indigestion, heartburn, cold sweats. And if there is a significant blockage in blood supply to the heart, then that portion of the heart muscle can actually die and heart muscle is unable to regenerate itself, so it will be replaced with non-functioning scar tissue. Coronary artery disease puts a person at risk of arrhythmias, heart failure, cardiogenic shock, and sudden cardiac arrest. Some ways to diagnose coronary artery disease are the coronary angiogram, which is pictured on this slide, and this is using a dye that will show up on an x-ray and injecting it into the coronary arteries. After the x-ray, doctors can see the blood throw, flow through the arteries and any blockages will be evident. We have the electrocardiograph, which records electrical activity of the heart and can detect changes to the heart's rhythm, heart attacks, and ischemia. Uh, there's the exercise and pharmacologic stress tests, and these determine how well the heart functions under stress by either having a client run on a treadmill or by using medication, and these can help detect angina and coronary blockages. We have an echocardiogram, which uses sound waves to detect how well the structures of the heart are working. And we have cardiac catheterization, which uh, inserts small tubes into the blood vessels of the heart. And this test evaluates the heart function and can detect the presence of coronary artery disease. When it comes to prevention of CAD, we really need to look at the lifestyle factors and try to minimize the causes and risks already mentioned. This could look like quitting smoking or avoiding secondhand smoke if you don't smoke, being active and aiming for a normal BMI, uh, managing stress to limit hypertension, eating a heart healthy balanced diet, and limiting alcohol consumption. There are medications that can be given to help with coronary artery disease. Some options that you may see prescribed are ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, nitrates, and antiplatelets. Each has a different etiology and how it will help with CAD. When it gets really bad, there are some procedures that can be done to get an adequate amount of blood flowing around the heart again. Three common ones are listed here. We have percutaneous coronary intervention. So a catheter is used to insert a stent into the arteries in order to open up vessels that have been narrowed by plaque buildup. Uh, coronary artery bypass graft surgery. This is taking a healthy blood vessel from another part of the body and surgically attaching above and below the blocked artery. The heart must be stopped for this surgery, and once the heart is started again, the blood will flow through the newly grafted vessel instead of trying to get through the blocked one. And then we have enhanced external counterpulsation, which is using inflatable cuffs on the lower body to apply pressure there. This helps improve blood flow to the heart and to create natural bypasses around blocked arteries. Current research to be found focuses on prevention and early detection of risk factors. A 2019 research conducted by Dr. Paolo Raggi focused on early detection in people with diabetes mellitus, since diabetes has been proven to be a risk factor for CAD. In the past, early detection for coronary artery disease was already tried with insignificant results. So, Raggi decided to screen people with asymptomatic type 2 diabetes for atherosclerosis, as opposed to coronary artery disease, using computed tomography and positron emission tomography applications. The goal is to detect preclinical atherosclerosis because that is the point in which intervention can have the most impact. This is ongoing research that has not yet been fully explored and requires more randomized trials to come to any substantial conclusions.